Sorry, I'm Penguin about the Con delay. 2015 Neuroscience. Now I have a rope here. Okay. Um, so, uh, this is sort of a continuation of a talk that I did last year, which was kind of on the same uh, format, uh, but different topics. It's not exactly the same talks I gave last year. Um, and it's sort of meant to be kind of like game style, so I will uh, talk about a technology or a scenario um, that is related, or that is found in science fiction, um, that is mostly related to neuroscience. I only have one that's semi-related to neuroscience. Um, and you basically have to guess whether or not that is a true thing that exists in the real world now or is in development to be existing in the real world, or if I've just totally made it up and it's still completely wrong with science fiction. Um, so my name is Heather Amon. I went to the University of Michigan and studied neuroscience. I currently work at a lab in the University of Michigan. Um, it's not a neuroscience lab, it's an enzymology lab. Uh, but my passion remains uh, within the fields of neuroscience. So on that note, let's get started. The very first one, I'm sure many of you have seen the movie Limitless, um, from 2011. It tells the story of a man who, uh, he's a writer, he suffers from writer's block and a general overall lack of motivation. Um, he, uh, his girlfriend dumps him because he's basically just a lazy bum. Uh, he stumbles across this nootropic substance called NZT48. He takes the drug and automatically he has these super enhanced learning abilities and uh, cognitive abilities. Um, he can learn really fast, he has really great memory, and he finishes his novel in record time. Um, so, is this true? I'm not talking about the drug at all. That's the drug that many people assume <laughs> this, <laughs> this movie was based on. Um, so Adderall can uh, increase focus and it can act as a stimulant to keep you awake, uh, but there are no, as far as I know, there are no studies to show that it can actually enhance your cognitive function. So. Could this exist? Are there drugs out there that can actually enhance cognitive function? Who thinks it's true? I think it's false. <laughs> Who thinks it's false? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. You guys are not going to like my answers today. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, the answer is true, but you don't want to take these drugs. Um, so unfortunately, uh, there are some caveats to all of these wonderful abilities that these drugs begin. Uh, so, uh, the first of which is valproate. So valproate or valproic acid is a drug that is given to um, people with uh, epilepsy and bipolar disorder and it works as a mood stabilizing drug. Um, it works, uh, the mechanism of action is that it's an HDAC inhibitor which, uh, overly simplified, it can uh, modulate genetic expression. Um, so, uh, what researchers have found is that if you give this drug to people, it can sort of reopen uh, critical periods of learning in their brains. <coughs> so um, perfect pitch, or absolute pitch, is the ability to be able to recognize tones and notes uh, uh, autom and automatically name them correctly. Um, and this is a really highly sought after uh, ability uh, <coughs> for people with musical talents. Um, the idea, though, is that even though this has a genetic component to it, um, it's more uh, likely to depend on a certain degree of musical training that has happened during that person's childhood. And so uh, there is actually no evidence of anybody acquiring this trait in adulthood, and if you don't learn it before the age of nine, you're pretty much not going to acquire this trait. <coughs> and so what these researchers did is they thought, okay, if this uh, seems to be based on this critical window, this uh, spongy period of time in our juvenile brains, if learning it is, requires that, um, and this drug reopens that window, or at least seems to. If we give people this drug, can we then teach adults how to acquire perfect pitch? And so, what they did uh, is they had test subjects, they, did, they divided them into two groups. Uh, one group took valproate, and one group took a placebo. Um, and they had them train for two weeks on uh, tasks that were meant to get them to acquire perfect pitch. So, they had um, six pitch classes from the 12 note Western musical system. Um, and they had actually given them proper names like Eric and Rachel and uh, all that to sort of level the playing field. So these people who had maybe had some d degree of musical training in the past and maybe already knew some of these notes, um, they wouldn't really know them by the new name. And so it would kind of level the playing field for people who had some musical training in the past. And then, um, 
uh, they, after the two-week period, tested these people on uh, a, a computer simulation that uh, had them it played uh, synthetic piano tones for them and had them try and guess what the note was based on these proper names. And so they found that the people who had taken the Velcroic acid uh, performed much better than chance and obviously much better than the placebo group at um, naming, uh, correctly naming these tones. <coughs> what they also, um, I didn't um, so yeah, so the ability to do this, it does exist. It, it seems to be able to open some sort of critical window. Uh, it seems to be able to induce some level of uh, acquisition of traits that you're not supposed to be able to acquire as adults. Um, and there are many other things that you can apply this to. You can apply this to language acquisition or learning musical instruments like that. Um, but <laughs> you definitely don't want to take this drug. So the list of very common side effects do you have any idea what the dosage was? Oh, I'm sure it says in the paper, but I don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, the list of very common side effects of this drug, uh, which occur in over 10% of people who take them, which is actually, it's quite large, um, uh, are horrible. Uh, so you could get diarrhea, tremor, hair loss, hyperandrogenism in females, which means they'll start to develop male physical features, uh, lazy eye. Uh, even the common ones that happen between 1 to 10% of the time are pretty bad. You, get, you can get hallucinations, ataxia, which means you kind of lose the ability to walk properly. These are really, really bad side effects. And so, you know, the idea is you don't want to take this if you don't have to. Um, you get, you have in the, the movie this really great, polished, charismatic, beautiful Bradley Cooper on this drug, <laughs> but the reality is <laughs> <laughs> that he's got his lazy eye going on and his tremors and he's probably pooping himself. And he's <laughs> so the idea is this, this medication is prescribed for very serious conditions and um, the risks simply don't outweigh the benefits if all you're trying to do is improve your cognitive function, go read a book, like that's pretty much the, the, the lesson there. Um, but that's not to say that that's the only drug that could possibly do that. And so <laughs> there's another drug called Donepazil. This one is given to uh, people with Alzheimer's. Um, and it is a, an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. Um, and so uh, acetylcholine esterase is found um, in the synaptic cleft between two neurons, so the, the synapse where they communicate with one another. Uh, and what happens is the presynaptic neuron, <clears throat> it wants to transmit a signal to the postsynaptic neuron. It creates uh, acetylcholine, releases it into the synaptic cleft that attaches to the acetylcholine receptor and it propagates that excitatory signal. Now the way our brain shuts off this excitatory signal is with acetylcholine esterase, which just degrades the acetylcholine. <laughs> so what donepsil does is it kind of dampens the effect of this and so it kind of increases the effect of this acetylcholine, is the theory. Um, and so what they found when they give this to people with Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, it increases their memory uh, in people who are having their brains just destroyed by this terrible disease. Um, other researchers have found when you give it to people who don't have uh, these cognitive impairments, they still have increased memory. They still have those sort of reopening of that neuroplastic uh, area uh, of juvenile development where you can start to learn things really well. But again, unfortunately, uh, these drugs often come with uh, in this case, somewhat uncommon, but still incredibly severe side effects. There are a lot of reports of donethazil induced mania, in which people <laughs> will exhibit hyper-religiosity, hypergraphia, pressured speech, spontaneous singing, talking to themselves, um, a whole host of other uh, symptoms that you don't want to be walking around with just because it makes you a little bit smarter. Uh, so, uh, again, there's more drugs. Uh, tons of drugs can do this stuff. Another one is called modafinil or provigil. Uh, this one is given to people with sleep disorders. This is the most interesting of the bunch. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a stimulant. Uh, it's meant to help keep them awake during the day so they can sleep better at night. Um, it's also used uh, during military operations so that when soldiers uh, suffer from fatigue or sleep loss due to extended missions, uh, they give them this to sort of keep them awake and, and vigilant. <laughs> and so, um, what they found when they gave this drug to individuals who had already been sleep deprived was that it made them grossly over exaggerate their own cognitive abilities. Um, they thought that they were much more Superman than they were. 
Um, so this group wanted to uh, test the effect of that drug on people who had not been sleep deprived. So basically, see if it still made them over-exaggerate or overestimate their own cognitive abilities, but also see if it could actually increase their cognitive abilities. Uh, and what they found through a series uh, of tests with people uh, on modafinil and on a placebo was that it actually did. It did help them increase uh, certain measures of motivation and vigilance, memory tasks, learning, all that. <coughs> but uh, another group uh, of researchers went back, looked at this study, looked at a bunch of other studies on this drug, and realized that they could uh, they noticed a, a trend in the data if they separated the people who had participated in these studies by lower IQ individuals and higher IQ individuals. And so what they seemed to find was that the effects of modafinil or ProVigil to give you these wonderful new cognitive abilities only worked on people who already had low IQs, which is great um, for them, <laughs> but the effect is dampened on people even I think in the, the high IQ group, the minimal threshold I think was like 115. So it's not like super geniuses that this doesn't work on. Um, you don't have to be that intelligent for this to basically not work anymore. Uh, so, so um, they look at the effects uh, of this lower IQ group. They perform much better than placebo, but the higher IQ group they performed at, statistically at least, at the same rate as the placebo. Um, and so yeah, you can get this effect if you're, you know, the Bradley Cooper at the beginning of the movie who needs all the help he can get. Um, now again, as you're noticing a trend, I hope, um, all of these drugs have uh, either very common serious side effects or some rare very serious side effects. Um, this one doesn't seem so bad, but <laughs> can probably be a little bit embarrassing. So, um, modafinil induced spontaneous unwelcome orgasms. There was a woman, um, and again, very rare, so there's one case report of this, but it's interesting to see what happens. This, this drug uh, affects the dopaminergic signaling in your brain, so it's interesting to see what happens when you affect that pathway. Um, she had to take this for uh, sleep disorders. Um, she was on it for a short period of time and noticed the symptoms starting, so she had this um, they lasted 5 to 15 seconds, they happened 3 to 5 times a day. Um, there was no warning for them when they would set off. There was no sexual stimulation required of any sort. They just happened. And so she found that as soon as she stopped taking this drug, this effect immediately halted. Um, so... So did she go back on it? <laughs> it just happened. <laughs> um, uh, no, she didn't go back on it. <laughs> They actually, the researchers actually urged her to go back on it to see if she could make it happen again. And she said unequivocally, no, I'm done with this, it's horrible. Um, so, so yes, if you uh, take Creeps through Beth, Bradley Cooper, and your panel, this is a really great drug for him. Uh, but normal people probably not. So uh, another more serious side effect again is uh, that ProVigil can induce psychosis. So um, they found uh, this one individual had narcolepsy and they, prescribed him um, a low dose of ProVigil. They had him on it for about six months, and then they had him come into the clinic and take a maintenance of wakefulness test to see, to assess whether or not he was capable of driving. Um, and so he came in, this test includes four periods of 40 minutes, where you basically uh, have to sit alone in a room and stay awake. And so after the first set, two sets of 40 minutes, he had done fine. By the third set of 40 minutes, he started talking to himself, he started laughing out loud, he started spontaneously singing. He started talking about how the CIA was persecuting him and the war on terror and yada, yada, yada. And so they went in there and stopped the study, obviously, and uh, assessed, what was to assess what the issue was. Uh, and it turns out he had taken five times the normal dosage of ProVigil in order to pass the test because he really wanted to drive again. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so the overdose of uh, ProVigil is likely what caused the psychosis. But this case report details several other cases where the exact same symptoms occurred uh, without overdose, with people who were taking the normal um, dosage of the drug. So, you know, super psycho Bradley Cooper is way smarter, but does it matter if you can't, if you spontaneously sing and talk about the CIA all the time? So, uh, something that they have found with other drugs that affect the dopaminergic pathways in the brain um, is this uh, lowered impulse control. So dopamine is the, one of the reward chemicals in your brain that controls motivation. 
And so if you screw with this uh, balance, it can have all sorts of weird effects uh, when it comes to impulse control. One of which that they found with other dopamine uh, type drugs is uh, pathological gambling. Um, and so this is the story of a man who uh, went on pro vigil for, I think, narcolepsy um, and wasted like $50,000 in a single year just on slot machines. Um, had his doctor take him off pro vigil, uh, changed his narcolepsy medication, and when his medication stopped, he immediately stopped gambling altogether. Um, and so, yes, we have super broke gambling Bradley Cooper, but hey, he's smarter. So, the point here is that, <laughs> yes, these drugs exist, and yes, they have shown, at least, you know, there's empirical evidence out there to suggest uh, that uh, they do enhance certain cognitive abilities. However, uh, the risks simply don't outweigh the benefits of taking any of these drugs. Okay. So, part two, and I think I have five. Um, Precognition and pre-crime. So in the 2002 movie Minority Report, um, and the book by Philip K. Dick, I think, um, there's this society where there's these clairvoyant precognition uh, beings who can predict uh, the near future and see crimes, and then they are put into this great machine with all these neural recording devices where they send all that information to a computer uh, in the pre-crime department where police officers can go and catch crime before it happens. Um, and so the idea is that uh, that we could find some sort of neuromodulatory hormones that could actually be possible, or that could actually possibly uh, have the body create a reaction to a stimulus that happens at some point in the future, and then send that over to a computer program in pre-crime type division. So, is this possible? Could this actually happen? Who thinks it's true? Skeptics. <laughs> and who thinks it's false? <laughs> All right. Well, y'all are very good at this game. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to at least stress that the human element of this uh, idea is false. Um, so the uh, it's not to say that humans don't actually have some sort of uh, predictive capacity. Um, and so there have been pretty well uh, designed experiments in respectable journals that have shown uh, empirically that people uh, have this sort of predictive anticipatory activity where on the scale of anywhere from one to 10 seconds into the future, we can uh, produce a response in our body to a stimulus that hasn't happened yet. Um, there's been, there have been uh, several, or actually two uh, meta-analyses of several um, uh, studies on this that uh, have tried to explain why or how this happens. Uh, one explanation is that we are truly uh, perceiving something that hasn't happened yet temporally in time. Uh, the, their model is sort of like if you imagine that this is like a river of time and this is where we are um, and this is the future event before it, uh, that hasn't occurred yet and we're here just sort of observing those ripples that it's making in that river. <coughs> One possibly more likely um, uh, explanation is that um, our unconscious brain is sensing a stimulus before our conscious brain is, is aware of it. And so although it seems as though uh, these things haven't happened yet because we're not consciously aware of them happening yet, our unconscious brain has already uh, recruited that response to it. And so whether or not humans are capable of this, who knows. Um, but we don't have any way to like, uh, any sophisticated way to use this in some sort of pre-crime device. Um, which is not to say that that doesn't exist though, uh, to some degree without the human element, uh, which is kind of scary. Um, <coughs> there's this company called Recorded Future uh, that basically takes the sum total of the information available on the internet and uh, sort of models possible, exp or possible uh, things that could happen in the future and pretty much any, you can manipulate this to use it in pretty much any way you would want to for like business applications. Um, both Google and the, uh, or the investment arm of the CIA have invested heavily in this. And on their website, it says that four out of five top companies on Earth, uh, top companies on Earth, already use this. Um, and that seems rather innocuous, uh, but this one doesn't. Um, <laughs> the, actually this week, uh, the Miami Police Department announced that they were going to start using uh, this program called Hunch Lab, which uh, on a certain level could be helpful, but also on a certain level could be abused. And it is that same, uh, idea behind recorded future, 
uh, overlaid geographically, basically, to a location. And so you can take all sorts of data that you collect about uh, crime uh, over time, uh, about weather patterns, about where there are, is construction, like all, all sorts of data, and use it to map when and where certain crimes are likely to occur in the future. Well, isn't that basically the same as predictive analysis for marketing? Yeah, that's exactly the same thing. <laughs> and that's what reported future is mostly used for, actually. Um, which, again, innocuous. This one, maybe not so much. Right. Um, the implications for abuse is really what it makes this terrifying to me, uh, is that it could be uh, used uh, as free evidence. Uh, uh, yeah, so there's a big, there's a big argument there, though, really. Oh, yeah. That's another talk. <laughs> not sure if I'm ready to do that. OK, um, so that one was false. Sorry. No pre -cabs. Um, okay, so number three, thought recording squids. In the uh, movie, 1995 movie Strange Days, uh, there are these uh, superconducting quantum interference devices, I think, or interface devices. Did I get it right? All right. <laughs> I don't know if you got it right, but it's pretty okay. good. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, the point of this, though, is that they are these headsets that you can wear, and it records your cortical output to uh, record a memory as you're creating it, and so that you can take a, a deck player thing uh, later on and uh, re-experience that memory, not just the visual component of that memory, but also the sensory output of that memory. And so the idea then is, could we create this with existing or near existing technologies? Who thinks this is possible? Ted Berger did this. What? <laughs> Ted, Ted Berger with his hippocampal prosthetics. Oh, okay, that. yeah, okay. That's similar. Uh, so who thinks it's false? Oh, not okay. Yeah, now that he spoke up. <laughs> 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 okay. I call this true-ish, and the only reason I put the ish in there is because we don't have anything quite as sophisticated as the squid technology um, that or anywhere, anything really close to it. Uh, we could, however, create an iteration based on a lot of different technologies that already exist or are near to existing uh, and sort of <laughs> mash them all together into the same idea as this. So if I had to explain how we could possibly take uh, neural output, cortical output, uh, and sort of decipher it, um, this is the study that I would cite. Uh, so a group of researchers in 2011 from the University of California in Berkeley, uh, basically their theory was that if you have uh, a way to record neural output and you have all of the possible external stimuli that could create that neural output, you could put them together and translate them. So you could read the neural output and figure out the stimulus that caused that. The only problem here is that the uh, sheer number of possible external stimuli is pretty much limitless. There is no way to create a reliable and sophisticated library of all the possible things that your brain could take in. Um, so what they did is they parsed that down. So they said instead of taking the library of all external stimulus, we're going to take a library of just these few hours of YouTube videos um, and, and consider that the only external so what they did is they had a bunch of subjects, uh, they put them in an MRI machine and recorded uh, fMRI, which is basically a, a correlate of uh, uh, neural output. <laughs> and so uh, they, they had them, while they were in the fMRI, uh, watch this series of YouTube videos. And then uh, had this computer program that they created match what that neural output looked like when they saw a certain portion of these videos. But later on, those people could go back into the fMRI, watch these videos, and then the computer program could effectively guess which videos they were watching. And so this is what that looks like. So if you're in the fMRI machine and you're watching this video, uh, the computer simulation is gonna say, well, I think 87% sure you're watching this video, but there's also a 7% chance you could be watching this video, 3% chance you're watching this video, yada, yada, yada. So it takes all those videos that it thinks you could possibly be watching based on the percentage chance that it thinks you're watching that video, and it layers them, and you get this effect. So when you're watching this video, the computer says, you must be watching this video. And when you're watching this video, the computer says, you must be watching this video. And this is uh, one of the better ones, that when the subject was in there watching this, the computer said, you're watching this. And if you actually go online, 
these are static images in my presentation just because I was too lazy to put video in, but <laughs> there's videos online of the playback of what this all looks like layered on top of each other. And it's really eerie, <laughs> and it looks kind of like you're watching a dream. Um, but they've effectively taken uh, neural output and matched it to external stimulus. So that part of the headset, sure it's possible, um, but many problems and hurdles exist before you could actually make that a sophisticated, reliable device. Um, other researchers did actually apply this to dreams. Uh, a team in Japan basically used the same logic to uh, look at the brains of sleeping individuals who had reported uh, during hypnagogic sleep what they had actually been dreaming about. They matched the words and the descriptions to the neural activity that they had while they were dreaming. Um, and the computer, this uh, specific one, only allowed the computer to guess the content because it matched, it matched the words that they used to describe their dreams to an image database. So it could tell you the content of what people were dreaming about, but not actually any real sophisticated playback. Um, so yeah, so can we record a core plot but turn it into a memory? Yeah, but it's uh, gonna it's gonna look like a fuzzy YouTube video, basically. So, so not really. Um, but the theory it, it works. Um, what would be a much more useful application of this technology is to simply record what's going on. Um, if we have uh, things that already do this, Google Glass can record both the images that you're looking at and the sounds uh, around you. I really like I've never used this device, so I don't know how long of a video you can record or what the quality looks like. So, I mean, I don't, <laughs> not quite sure on that. But um, it seems uh, like this would be a much better way to be able to play that back, uh, that memory back, and just simply try and layer the other sensory perceptions on top of it. Um, now, in the movie, they uh, noted that you could wear the squids underneath a wig so that other people couldn't tell that you were wearing the squid and recording them. Um, and so Google Glass does not let you do that. Um, but if you could develop this into, say, a contact on your eye, uh, you could maybe do that. Uh, that could be possible. Um, and the very infant, tiny beginnings of this technology is in development um, for a wirelessly powered active contact lens. And what this is supposed to eventually be able to do is allow you to not only record, but play back images layered over your own vision. So, uh, like in the movie The Terminator, where he's got like the, the thing scrolling down, you, you potentially be able to see that, or have a memory play over uh, the environment that you're in. Now, where it's at right now is, like I said, baby steps. It's very much not ready for human use. At the moment, they only can make it work with one uh, LED. <laughs> But it works, is the important part. <laughs> but and uh, it doesn't work very far from its power source, um, which is uh, bulky from what I understand. Also, it's never been put in a human eye to see how we might react to it or how it might react to the eye. Uh, it's only been tested in rabbits, uh, in which, in rabbits, it works quite well. Uh, it doesn't cause any major response in the rabbit, but we can't ask the rabbit how it feels, so there's that. Um, <laughs> so uh, then the issue would be more, um, how do you create that memory uh, with an immersive, immersive effect in the playback portion? Um, and so we already have technologies that can kind of sort of do this. Uh, for example, the virtual reality headset Oculus Rift, you could basically record a memory, uh, memory uh, record, record an event, um, and then be able to possibly play it back in an interactive way so that you can actually interact with that memory in Oculus Rift. Um, <clears throat> as far as other as far as other senses are concerned, uh, there is a burgeoning field called haptic technology that basically allows you to record uh, the tactile sensations of an event and then play it back later. It'll uh, produce uh, pressure or vibrations or even a heat signature on your hands or other parts of your body for whatever other devices you could use in haptic technology um, to basically play back the tactile sensations of an event. <laughs> Again, this is also a uh, technology that's sort of in its infancy, infancy but uh, it's out there. Um, you could also do it with taste. So there is a researcher named uh, Adrian Schock at City University of London who uh, has this sort of electric taste machine uh, where you put your tongue in between these two plates and uh, different patterns of electric electrical stimulation 
will fool your taste receptors on your tongue into thinking you're tasting different tastes. Um, and so uh, this would be kind of a, a bulky thing <laughs> to uh, add to this uh, playback, but it is possible. But if I could do chocolate, um, we all want one. Right? No, I, I, I'm sure. I'm sure I could do chocolate. <laughs> if they don't do it with chocolate, then what's the point? Um, uh, it's interesting to note, though, that this haptic technology, um, they've also